So um, as Kevin mentioned, um, I am actually a trained communications professional. Um, I did my undergraduate and master's in um, communication studies. Um, and for my PhD, that's when I started um, looking at linguistic anthropology and just dabbing my toe um, a little bit into it. Um, so today's lecture is going to look more on the communication theory side. Um, and then I'm going to uh, present some um, complementary um, linguistic anthropology concepts um, as they apply. Um, and I hope that um, if you have any questions or if you have any experiences, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and join on in um, because I, I love learning from other people just as much as I um, you know, enjoy just you know, talking and discussing these different things. So before I start, um, when we mentioned theory, um, the, the best quote I ever heard was that the best theories seem like common sense. Um, whenever you hear them, you're like, well, yeah, no kidding. Um, duh. <laughs> like, how is that theory? Um, and it's just because it means that that, uh, that theory really um, has been tried and true and um, that it's very applicable to the scenarios that we're going to look at. Um, so um, I'm going to be uh, borrowing a lot from Little John and Foss, um, who are communications experts. Um, and the main thing that they that they um, emphasize is that there's not one communication theory um, that we should be striving for. Um, we shouldn't be trying to think of you know the one perfect theory that encapsulates everything. Um, if anything, we need to um, remember that you know there's many schools of thoughts, um, and that you know there's a lot of wisdom that can be found in all the different communication theory. And if anything, we should try to see how they work and they interact with each other to create you know, a better understanding of what is going on. So these are two quotes from, um, from them about that. Um, but before we start uh, diving into the seven uh, traditions of communication theory, um, these are the seven that we will go through. Um, and I promise you, they are not as um, scary as they look on, on this slide. Um, I wanted to provide a quick look at this diagram. Um, Typically, in any discussion that we have, um, we have two individuals um, who are trying to communicate with each other. Um, and as you can see, there's a message that's going from one person to the other. And, you know, as they, they continue exchanging messages, it becomes a conversation. Um, and around the, the two people um, who are trying to communicate with each other, they're starting to form a relationship. Um, and those relationships can become very deep or they can be superficial. They could be just, you know, people who pass by each other and just acknowledge each other um, and nothing too intimate. But what also affects their communication, their conversations and the relationship are organizations, the groups that are around them, the media. Uh, we've seen a lot of the media actually affecting relationships in a, in a huge way in the last two to three years. Um, and finally, the culture and society itself. Um, so there's a lot of factors that, um, that interplay with the messages that we, we say. So communication itself isn't just trying to talk to one another. Um, it's, a, it's a whole um, network or a whole framework of all these different factors that influence it. So I, I would love for you to keep that in mind as we're talking about these different theories um, and traditions. Um, so semiotic tradition, the first one that uh, um, I'm going to introduce tonight, um, in communication theory, we, we talk about signs and symbols. And as you can see um, in the notes, it says that signs refer to something that is very real. Um, that's something that exists in real life, whereas symbols are more arbitrary. So I want you to look on the left-hand side. Um, you can see that, you know, there's a symbol of a cigarette that's uh, lit up. And so you can see smoke fuming from it. And the symbol next to it, it's a circle and a, and a cross over it saying no smoking. And these are kind of universal signs because when you see this image, you know exactly what it's talking about because you can picture in your mind a cigarette that's burning. However, what do you think? And you can uh, feel free to use the chat. I'm going to um, 
bring up the chat on the side for me so I can see your responses, or you can feel free to unmute yourselves. What do you think the, the symbols on the right mean? Okay, thank you, Ralph. So the first one says infinity. Yeah, the first one's infinity. I get another infinity. Any other guesses for either of the, the two on the right hand side? Well, thank you very much for participating with that. So it is correct um, what Ralph and Roselle had mentioned that it's infinity sign and that's a mathematical sign. However, um, for Kevin who lives here in Alberta with me, we might think that it's actually the sign for Métis. Um, there's a, a group of indigenous people in Canada who use this as part of their sign to represent their community. I also have a son who happens to have autism. And there's a group um, who, of people who have autism who also use this sign to represent their group as well. So even though this one sign might mean infinity to some people, for others, it's a cultural symbol. For other people, it's a symbol of their group and of belonging to a group. So that's what we mean by it's arbitrary. Um, it depends on you know, who you are or where you are, it might have different meanings. And then the symbol next to that, that triangle with the exclamation point, um, to be honest, it can mean anything, right? Um, some people might think, oh, it just means pay attention. But who knows, like in some cultures, um, you know, there isn't even an exclamation point. So for them, that, that symbol means nothing because they don't have that type of, you know, um, that type of symbol in their uh, in their culture or in their society. Um, and so in the semiotic tradition, um, they make a real clear distinction between signs that are very um, literal and things that you know people can see in real life versus symbols, which are, again, arbitrary. And it just depends on your experience with different um, uh, what things look like. Um, and when I was thinking about linguistic anthropology, it kind of made me think about, um, you know, speech, which is what is said, versus language, which is speech and gestures, right? Um, um, I believe most of you might have um, had a chance to learn about Saucer's Lang versus Parol, which is, you know, the rules of language versus what is what is actually said or written, right? So, for example, um, that infinity sign, the rule might be um, that it's a mathematical symbol meaning infinity, right? But what is actually there um, might mean something different. And, you know, these aren't perfect, um, uh, you know, um, analogies per se, but these are some things that, you know, where um, the linguistic anthropology and the communication theories somewhat intersect and they, um, you know, can enrich in um, what our meaning of language and what things mean. Um, I also thought about, again, something from um, anthropology, the sapphire wharf hypothesis or the theory of linguistic relativity, um, which the structure of language also shapes how we perceive reality, right? Um, so for example, um, when we think about, um, you know, um, certain languages, which are, are very, um, how do you say, uh, they're very straightforward and very, um, you know, uh, there might be um, time elements that are very strict and, you know, um, it's a very structured language. Whereas there's some languages that are, are a lot more descriptive um, and a lot more, um, you know, um, you know, vibrant in their descriptions. It will also change how you look at symbols as well. Um, sometimes, you know, symbols will be like very, you know, black and white, this is what it means. Whereas another symbol, again, depending on how your, your language is, it might be like, oh, it means this. Um, so those are kind of interesting ways that I've seen a little bit of um, some concepts intersecting each other between um, communication theories and ling linguistic anthropology. On the next slide, I'm going to go further into how linguistic anthropology um, looks at um, 
nonverbal communication. So, um, for example, we have a uh, bird whistles study of kinesics or body language, as well as Edward Hall's study of proxemics or the use of space in communication. Um, and those were very interesting to me because in communication theory, we basically, um, you know, just say, well, Body language just, um, you know, it helps people understand, you know, whether you're you're happy or you're sad, if you're distant or not. But in anthropology, it goes a lot deeper and a bit more richer. Um, and so I've listed like, you know, six different factors in Halls's uh, study of proxemics. Um, you can look it up um, for more information. Um, but the things that were really interesting to me was, um, for example, in kinesthetics or factors, it's the distance between each other. As you might know, um, in some languages, or sorry, some cultures, um, you can stand really close to each other because you know the distance between people um, is, is not a problem. You know, you can be really close and talk to each other. Whereas in some other cultures, it's more proper to stand further away from the person that you're speaking to. If you get too close, it's actually a little bit um, awkward, or it might be considered rude if you're too close. Um, whereas I know for some of my friends who are from South America, it's totally fine to be very close to somebody you're talking to. Um, so that's something that um, in communication theory, we, we start talking about intercultural communication and body language, but we don't get into such detail like um, Edward Hall did with kinesthetic factors. Um, Again, with haptic uh, haptic code or touching behavior, it's how are people touching each other? Are they, you know, um, just lightly caressing somebody, you know, to comfort them, or if they're just like, you know, being a very hearty like tap on the back to say, hey, you know, something's going on. Um, the visual code um, talks about eye contact um, because I used to live in Japan. Um, it wasn't very often that you would actually do straight eye contact with um, others, um, mainly because it would be perceived as almost like you're staring and you're being rude, or it might be a challenge to authority. Um, things are changing slowly, though, um, especially with um, how um, there's so much um, intercultural um, communication and more people getting used to other cultures, forms of communication. So it's not like anything where, you know, if you go to Japan and you, if you talk to someone and you make eye contact that they'll think you're rude, things are slowly changing where, you know, eye contact is not perceived to be as, um, as challenging as it used to be. Um, whereas in North America, if you, if you do not make eye contact, it's seen as you're being rude or that you might be lying. So again, um, the whole idea of, you know, eye contact and communicating different things is very interesting to me. Um, there's thermal codes, believe it or not, um, how warm you're emitting heat um, is part of the study of proxemics. Um, the olfactory code or a better <laughs> word for it, your sense of smell, um, it talks about like pheromones and such. So for example, you know, um, if someone can, you know, the odors that people are picking off of you and what does that communicate? Um, and, you know, at first I was like, okay, you know, does it mean like, you know, if we're not smelling well or not, but it's even things such as like, you know, if we choose to use perfume or if we choose to, you know, um, use deodorant or something, trying to mask our, our smells. And what does that communicate um, as well? Um, and then finally, voice loudness. Um, again, are we trying to speak, you know, um, in low tones? Um, maybe it's a sign of trying to sound calm. Um, or do we speak, you know, in very loud tones to try to, I don't know, maybe seem like you're, you know, you have authority or so. Um, and what does it mean in different cultures? Because again, sometimes being very loud um, does not mean that you're powerful in a certain culture. If anything, it just means that, you know, you're insecure and you're just trying to cover it. Um, so again, um, this is where linguistic anthropology is so rich um, in its theory. Um, and I, I really appreciate how it helps with um, complementing communication theory. Um, the next slide that I'm going to show talks a little bit about these nonverbal codes um, and what it communicates to us. So um, here, sorry, I'm, here we go. Here are two movie posters. 
So many of you might recognize the one on the left is from Star Wars and the one on the right is from Iron Man. Using some of the things that we just spoke about in terms of nonverbal cues, um, you know, distances between each people and like how people are, you know, um, you know, touching each other or not. What are your impressions of the women in these two posters? And what are your impressions of the men in these two posters? You can feel free to unmute yourself if you want, or you can put into the chat. Okay, so we have Ralph saying that men are supposedly the heroes or saviors while the women are the ones protected. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. Yeah, yeah. And Myra says Iron Man's poster shows intimacy between them. Um, it says Pepper seems to be dependent on, to Tony's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Pepper, um, the woman in the, the right uh, uh, hand poster, um, Gwyneth Paltrow, her character seems to be dependent on Tony Stark. Thank you for that. That's absolutely correct. Um, you're right. So um, on the right hand poster, there's some type of intimacy between them. And um, if you've seen the movie, yes, um, they're actually, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend um, in, in the show. Um, and so um, that whole idea of, of that intimacy for Myra is spot on. Um, and Ira, you, you're also very correct when you say Pepper seems to be dependent on on Tony Stark, because, you know, she's, she's, you know, holding on to him or, you know, she has her hand on his chest and she, you know, um, it looks like she needs to be protected, um, at, just as Ralph was saying. Um, the interesting thing about the Star Wars one, I think, actually, is that um, the, the female in the Star Wars one, she kind of looks a little bit more independent as well. She holds a gun, although it's not very apparent that she's holding a gun. But she also kind of has her own stance a little bit. Um, it's not as, um, you know, dependent on, on the man in this poster as well. But I'm really glad that many of you picked up on, like, you know, how close were the women compared to the 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 hero, the man, the men um, in these posters, but also, you know, what did it mean? Um, because if the, the female on the left-hand side, let's say she was holding on to, you know, the, the man's leg, again, that might've been something where it kind of signals to, to you that she needs protection, or maybe she has some type of intimate um, um, relationship with him. Um, funny enough, as you all know, um, there's three movies in the Star Wars um, original trilogy, at least. Um, and by the th third um, poster, it has a woman um, in the arms of Han Solo, um, who ends up being her um, partner in that movie. So um, at first, she starts off as very independent. But then um, as the, the movie posters go on into the second and third one, she gets actually more sexualized um, and eventually um, turned into more of a, a, an object of desire rather than that independence in the first um, film. So thank you very much for participating um, and sharing your ideas with that uh, question that we just had. So um, I'm going to move on into the second one, um, which is the phenomenological tradition. And <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying it right, to be honest. Um, it takes me a long time to, to say these things correctly. Um, but essentially, it's the idea that um, the things that happen around you are actually um, influenced by, or the way you perceive the things that are happening around you is influenced by your personal experiences. Um, so it might be something where, you know, um, you had a really bad um, incident with a dog at one point. Um, and so maybe um, afterwards, each time you see a dog, you might feel that you're going to have a bad experience. Um, and it's all based on the, the understanding of, of you as an individual and how you've experience the world and how you're going to interpret things afterwards. Um, and so 
there's an example of this um, with um, the concept of distanciation um, that was um, developed by Paul Ricoeur. Um, he's a, a French philosopher. Um, and the idea of distanciation is that the text um, can be written with some type of meaning by the author. Like, um, you know, I'm writing an email to someone and I'm, I'm trying to, to let them know um, that, you know, maybe uh, some bad news. And I'm trying to be nice about it. You know, it's like, you know, um, unfortunately, your vacation is not approved or something. But what happens is when the person receives that email on the other side, um, the text says something and they can't hear my tone of voice. They can't perceive my intention. Um, they don't understand, like, you know, if I'm writing it, like, you know, um, in a nice way or in a, in a not so nice way. Um, that's what is meant by the separation of text from situation. Um, basically, you just receive this text and it says, unfortunately, your, your vacation is not approved. And again, depending on how you might have experienced this before, perhaps you had a manager that was really mean to you all the time. You might take that text and say, oh, my manager is mad at me. Um, or, you know, you, if you've had, you know, okay experiences with managers, you might say, oh, okay, they just didn't approve it. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and you don't look more into it. Um, but that's, again, part of the phenomenological tradition, um, which is, you know, depending on your experiences in the past with, you know, rejection or approvals or, or things like that, um, it will shape how you view the text, it will shape how you view the, the interaction. Um, even if your boss really meant to just say, oh, you know, it wasn't approved, maybe because everyone else was asking for the same time, you might, um, if you've, again, had bad experiences where you're always being rejected, you might say, oh, my boss really hates me. And you might be very sad about it. But that may not be the case at all. It might really just be that, you know, um, it just so happened that somebody asked before you and they got the time instead. Um, and so, again, with the whole idea of distanciation, the interpretation is on the receiver's end, um, despite whatever intention the author had. And it always ends up with what we say appropriation, which is um, you come to your own um, understanding of what is being said, uh, rather than, you know, what the author um, had originally intended. And I put a YouTube clip here for you to watch later on. Um, I won't air it because um, what I found is that um, whenever I air YouTube clips, sometimes it actually, um, uh, uh, it messes up the video uh, for whoever's posting it afterwards, because sometimes YouTube says, oh, you have some um, clips that are copyrighted. And so then you can't post it afterwards. So I didn't want to do that to Kevin. So I'll let you have a chance to watch that YouTube clip on your own. Um, just as a preface, it's about a person um, who tries to um, uh, explain pride and prejudice in their own words um, instead. And it's quite hilarious. Um, it's a fellow who um, explains pride and prejudice um, as a um, kind of like as a rap star thug <laughs> personality. Um, but again, the whole idea of that clip is to show how even though the author um, had written this book centuries ago, even today, um, you know, we draw our own conclusions of what was meant. And especially because we don't know um, what the author really means, um, our interpretations can differ very much from person to person, depending on our experiences um, in real life. I do have an example of this, um, though, on the next slide. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, the blue side is what the author meant, and the green side is what your English teacher thinks the author meant. So for instance, the curtains were blue. And if you've ever taken an English class, um, your teacher might say, the curtains represent his immense depression and his lack of will to carry on. But maybe the, what the author really meant was the curtains were blue. 
And again, that's distanciation at work. Um, for somebody who uh, might think a lot more into the meanings of colors, um, you know, you, we've always heard of um, blue either meaning, um, we've heard of the sayings true blue, which means loyalty, or I'm feeling blue, like I'm feeling sad and depressed. Um, and so in the first instance with what the teacher is thinking, um, they're putting so much rich imagery into it. It's like, oh, blue curtains, that means they're so sad and, you know, the curtains shut. And so, you know, we're drowning out light. And so, you know, it's, you can make it very dramatic if you really want to, but maybe the author really just meant the curtains were blue and they didn't have any other ulterior motive um, to, to mention the color other than the fact that it was blue. Um, and so, that is distanciation um, at play again, um, when somebody has a certain intent and when um, the receiver of the message or somebody who reads it without knowing the intent makes their own interpretation. I want to ask you, have you ever had an experience of that where perhaps either you wrote something and it was completely, you know, um, changed by uh, in meaning by somebody else or perhaps where you know perhaps you read something and you miss it or you interpreted it a completely different way from how the author had written it yes uh i see a, a thumbs up um would you like to unmute yourself and explain Okay, I, well, I'm not sure if you'd like to unmute and explain or not, or if you'd like to just uh, type it in, that's totally fine. But um, I, I get this all the time with text messages, <laughs> you know, like somebody texts me something and then I, I, I maybe I'm reading it too quickly or I'm not reading with the right frame of mind and I misinterpret it. Um, I've had that happen many times. Um, but yes, for sure, if anybody wants to share um, later on, uh, feel free to um, put in the chat or raise your hand or simply unmute yourself um, and uh, share your story as you'd like. If there's nobody else who wants to, to share at this time, I guess we can just move on to the next slide. So the cybernetic tradition, um, it's not about computers, it's not about you know, cybersecurity or anything like that. That's what I thought at first when I heard about it. Um, rather, um, the cybernetic tradition talks about communication being a, a complex system with parts that interact and influence one another. Um, and so I kind of reduced it a bit to say it's a web of interdependent parts um, or relationships. And the whole idea um, in this system is that it tries to balance itself or to maintain control. And I hope that the next um, example will give a better idea of what I'm trying to, to mean. Um, because um, when you think about a system, it works best when things are in balance, right? Um, you know, if you think about your body, right? Um, if something goes out of whack, like let's say, you know, um, I, my, one of my parents is diabetic. Um, when the sugar is too high, um, the, the body just can't, you know, it starts um, acting strange because it's not in balance. Um, same thing when the, the sugar is too low, the body's trying to, you know, get more sugar in it. And so the system works best when things are in balance. And so um, Festinger had this idea about cognitive dissonance um, theory. And this is when we try to balance the negative um, uh, thoughts that come in our head. And it's not negative as in, you know, oh, you know, you hear bad news or anything. Um, but essentially, um, it, the idea of dissonance is when you have um, a piece of information that actually goes against the things that you know or believe or value. And it creates, you know, a little bit of, of imbalance because you hear something and you're like, oh, that doesn't sound right. Or, hmm, this is not something that I know, or this is not something that I, I 
I've learned about something that I value or something that I hold significant to myself. Um, and it's creating this kind of pressure inside of yourself because you're trying to take in this new knowledge um, and, it's, and it's challenging what you believe. Um, and as individuals, it's very natural for us to try to reduce or avoid this negative feeling. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I don't like feeling you know, confused. I don't like feeling sad or, or upset. Um, and so we try to reduce this, this negative feeling by um, trying to justify things in our own head. And I'll give you an example of it um, because it's, um, it happens quite a bit. And hopefully this example will help illustrate what I mean. So in Canada, many of us are very proud to be Canadians. Um, we like to think that Canada is a very um, multicultural community, that we're very accepting of people, um, and that, you know, we've been contributing, you know, good things to the world. And so as Canadian citizens, we, we want to be proud and we want to say, yeah, we do things that, you know, help people and we, you know, we value, you know, human rights and we value being good people. Um, and those are the things that we tell ourselves. Um, in fact, you know, that's what many countries citizens tell themselves, right? You know, what have they done to make the world a better place? Or, you know, what parts of their country make them really proud to be from there? Um, unfortunately, Canada has a very shameful history of something called the residential school system, which was in effect for over 100 years. Um, we have Indigenous people who live in Canada um, who were the original inhabitants of Canada. Um, and when settlers or people from Europe and other parts of the world came to Canada and settled in, in this country, um, they made treaties with the Indigenous communities to share the land. But unfortunately, um, these treaties were not honored. And instead, um, many of the people who sought power um, to you know, control resources, control the land, um, they introduced this idea of a residential school system where they took children from their indigenous communities and put them into um, schools that were very harmful for them. Um, they were not allowed to speak their language. They were not allowed to see their families. Um, they were often abused and many other very horrific things happened to these children. Um, many children actually died um, as a result of being at these schools because they were um, malnourished, um, they were beaten, um, and many of them tried to run away. Um, and sometimes they died as a result of being there. Um, and also, um, because of the conditions back then, many of them caught um, sicknesses and died as a result. And earlier um, in about, in the last year, year and a half or so, um, it came to light that we, we started discovering mass graves of these children um, that were at these schools. Um, and this, these school systems actually ended in 1996. Um, so, not even 20, well, about 20 some years ago, you know? Um, so it's not very long ago that they ended. Um, and for many Canadians, when this news came out, it shocked many people to the core. And it provided that dissonance that we're talking about. It provided that negative feeling of, this is not the Canada that I know. Um, this is not the story that, you know, I am proud to be Canadian about. Um, these are not things that that make me feel good. And so what might happen is that when people experience this cognitive dissonance, they might say things like, well, it wasn't that bad, was it? Or they might say, well, you know what, maybe some people actually, you know, received good education, and they were better for it. Um, or they might say, no, I don't think it's it's right. I don't think it's true. And they'll just, you know, say, you know, this these are lies. I don't believe it. And that's what the cognitive dissonance theory is, is when you start trying to justify in your mind the things that challenge your values or challenge your beliefs um, and things like that. And then you try to make that negative feeling go away. Um, and that is something that I think 
all of us experience um, at some point, um, whether it's things that, you know, um, again, things that challenge the things that you believe, um, things that you challenge um, your values. Um, this cognitive dissonance is, is very real, um, and it's a, a major part of communication theory, that um, when people are presented with new information that um, goes against what they believe, that they'll kind of go one in two ways. They'll either try to reduce that cognitive dissonance and avoid the new information, or um, you could try to absorb the new information and try to relearn or re-evaluate um, what you're thinking and what your values are. And so um, hopefully that was, um, an okay ex explanation of what the cybernetic tradition and what cognitive dissonance is. Um, it, does anyone have any questions about that or um, have any experiences with it? Or um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, again, put into the chat or we can do it in the Q&A session as well. Okay, so going back into more um, <laughs> traditional uh, traditions um, in the, communication theory, um, the social psychological tradition. Um, this is something that um, is actually, I, I felt uh, resonated with me quite a bit um, because I grew up um, in Canada um, and there, you know, there weren't uh, many people like me <laughs> growing up. And you'll see why when I uh, go into more examples later on. Um, so the social psychological tradition focuses on individuals and all the social um, behavioral things, the psychological variables, personalities and traits and perceptions that we have. Um, and so sometimes um, there's two major branches that uh, we, we talk about. Um, so there's a behavioral where we learn or unlearn things based on um, the reaction of others. So for example, um, we might learn to make eye contact with people when we're speaking, um, but we unlearn to stare. Right. So um, people might say, oh, yeah, make eye contact. But as soon as you start staring at them and you don't stop, you know, looking at them like this and it kind of gets creepy for people, you unlearn that behavior. Um, you're like, OK, staring is not cool. Eye contact is good, but not staring. Got it. Um, and again, the cognitive aspects of, of communication, um, it's the idea of when you're in a situation, how you acquire information, you store it in your brain and you process it in order to act in a certain situation and how that um, actually influences how you do it again in the future. So it might be something where, for example, if you're going um, um, you know, to a new country and, and you know, you um, go to try to shake someone's hand and you realize that the person doesn't shake your hand. If anything, they, they look at you and, like, and they kind of do a head nod instead. You might think to yourself, okay, someone head nodded instead of shaking my hand. Okay, so you acquire that knowledge, you store it in your head and you process it. And so then the next person you see, you nod your head and they're like, okay, and they nod back instead. And you're like, okay, I've got it. Um, in this situation, we don't shake hands. We just nod instead. Um, so those are, are some of the things that uh, we, we talk about in the social psychological tradition. Um, has anyone ever done a Myers-Briggs personality type test? Um, these are things like the next slide, which I'm going to turn to. What's your whatever personality, right? You answer a bunch of questions and then it's like, ta-da, you are this. Has anyone ever done that? Okay, I'm not seeing many hands, but <laughs> it's something that we do quite a bit of in North America. Um, we do a lot of quizzes because it's fun. We love to talk about ourselves. We love to, you know, pick answers based on things that, you know, are important to us. Um, and so um, in companies, um, actually, uh, and I'll go back to the pr previous slide to show you what I was mentioning. Um, the Myers-Briggs personality type test um, has been used in some companies to try to form teams even. Um, this is how serious some people take this communication theory. Um, so um, 
it will measure things like, you know, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, or if you're really good at like consulting, or if you're really good at listening and being perceptive and all these different traits. Um, and, um, you know, you may agree with it or not agree with it. Uh, for me, um, I, I, I don't think that we can necessarily be boxed into one specific um, group all the time. We're very fluid people, you know, whatever is the strength today. Um, might uh, continue to be a strength in the future, but what's a weakness right now can become a strength also in the future. Um, and so sometimes what happens with these um, personality type tests are like, okay, there's four personalities in the world. And if you're this one, we need one of each type of person on a team. Um, and that's seriously what some corporations do nowadays. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, just because again, we change over time. Um, just because, you know, I happen to have these traits now in the future, maybe I would improve on some of my weaker traits. Um, and then, you know, um, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not specifically this type anymore. Um, but it is a, a big thing in, in North America. Uh, I'm not sure if it's one of those things that people are doing um, too much of anymore in the in the workplace. Um, but I do know um, about um, about 10 years ago or so, um, there was literally corporations making their employees take this test so they can make super teams. Um, so that was a very interesting um, trend in communications um, back about 10 years ago. Um, but I'm not sure if it's happening as much now. Um, but it is something that we've been looking at. And then jumping two slides ahead. Again, as I mentioned before, um, this was something that resonated with me because again, um, growing up in Canada, um, I wasn't, um, I, I, I was very different from all of our neighbors. Um, we lived in a, a community where I was one of very, very few Asians. In fact, I think there's only two Asian families uh, in our whole school. Um, and everyone thought we were like, you know, um, cousins or something just because we happen to be Asians together. Um, so the communication accommodation theory um, under the social psychological tradition um, looks at you know, how people shift their communication styles to belong in a group or to separate themselves and show their identity. Um, and so what uh, the two words that they, they use is divergence and convergence, right? And it's just, it's part of adjusting how you speak um, and even the words you say, right? And so, um, for example, whenever, um, I found other people of Asian backgrounds, you know, we could speak in, you know, different ways. We could talk about different topics and suddenly we were a group together. Um, and, you know, we had shared experiences and, you know, it, we felt, you know, um, we felt as if we were a unit, as if we were one community. Um, and that's the, that whole idea of, you know, um, and I know it sounds strange, it's divergent, you know, try to group yourselves together um, to show that, hey, we are different from everyone else, right? Um, but there is that whole idea of, of belonging in that group. However, convergence is also something that I found that I would do as well, um, where because again, my background was very different from um, the uh, Caucasian Canadians that I was um, with at school. So, you know, I would, you know, try to change my speaking style to match theirs instead. And then and suddenly I'm converging into their group. Um, and again, it's, um, I, I'm not sure if it was for social approval or if I was necessarily a powerless individual as um, it was, it's mentioned here, but I think it's an idea of, okay, you know, I'm not typically part of this group. So I'm going to try to like, you know, converge with this group by changing how I speak so that, um, uh, that, you know, I pass to be part of the group. And sometimes um, there's studies um, and it's called code switching um, where people might have a certain way of speaking um, and then they switch, they code switch, so that you know they can suddenly be in a different group, um, and that happens quite a bit. And I'm not quite sure if anyone else here has ever experienced it or not, um, but I know it happens. Um, you know, if you have different dialects of of language, even um, I know that, um, for example, when I was living in Japan again, there was different dialects. Um, 
in Japan. And so um, some people um, from Osaka, they were super proud of having this special dialect called Osaka Ben, which is, you know, a really, um, you know, Japanese people don't understand what they're saying, basically, because it's so specific to their region. And so if they were very proud, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I speak Osaka. And they would, you know, you know, be like, we're very proud of it. And it would become a very, um, uh, a thing to help emphasize that they're different from everyone else. Um, however, if you're the only person who speaks Osaka in a, in a community, you're like, okay, I'm going to switch over to um, standard Japanese and try to fit in with everyone else. And maybe people might not, you know, uh, know that I'm from that area. Um, same thing happens in, in China as well with all the different uh, dialects. Um, some people are very proud of speaking, um, you know, Cantonese. And so it's like, we're Cantonese speakers. And, you know, they, they, you know, switch the way they speak. Um, not only just a dialect, but you know, just the the tone, the mannerisms, and everything. Um, but then, when they're the only person who speaks that, again, they might just switch back into the style of the majority. So, um, if is there any questions here at this point about the social psychological tradition and communication accommodation theory? And you'll have to excuse my my two sons; they're they're outside making the noise. So. Okay, um, there's a social cultural tradition and there's only a few more slides. So um, <laughs> don't worry, it's, uh, it's not gonna go on forever. But um, the social cultural tradition um, focuses on the patterns of interaction between people. Um, and they, it tries to make sense of how people are interacting with each other and making meaning and whether they are actually communicating with each other. Um, and so the actual theory that I picked out for this one um, is a speech act theory, which identifies um, what, what it takes to make a successful statement. Um, and again, it's like Seltzer's long versus parole, um, where, you know, there's the rules of language that are, are definite and they're strict. But then, you know, what do you actually say to make sense as well? And so um, this could be, you know, for when you're asking for something, you might be warning someone or just stating something. Um, there's all these different um, situations um, where you're trying to, to communicate something to someone else. And if you don't have like all of the language um, to, to say what needs to be said, can you make yourself understood still? Um, and that's what the social cultural tradition looks at is just, again, the pattern of interaction rather than what's actually said. So in this next um, slide, I'm gonna give you um, something that I had overheard. Um, it was at a party um, and, um, you know, people were, were getting ready to leave and, and such. And so um, I had heard this at the party, Sean's dad, can you give can you ride me home and I was just like huh I you know I was just like that that's not um proper English grammatically per se it, it doesn't um make grammatical sense in English um can anyone unmute themselves or put into the chat what do you think he was trying to say So um, seeing that there's none, um, what, I, what I thought he was trying to say was, can you give me a ride home, right? Um, because right now what it says here, it's the whole idea of, you know, almost like, hey, like I'm a horse, ride me, you know, ride me like a horse home or whatever. And so I, I kind of looked and I'm just like, okay, I wonder how, how you know, Sean's dad's going to, to respond. And he responded, yeah, I can ride you home. And I was just like, what? Um, even though, and it happened to be that both people um, did not have English as their first language, but they understood what was being communicated. Um, so even though they didn't have the correct 
you know, long, as Sassur would say, the, the correct language or the rules behind the language, they had parol, you know, they had what it took to make that communication happen. So individual one, can you ride me home? Can you give me a ride home, right? Individual two, yeah, I can ride you home. Yes, I can give you a ride home. Um, even though, you know, for anybody who might come across this and be like, that didn't make sense. What was most important was they did make sense to each other and they did get that communication across despite not having the lang or the rules of, of language there. Um, they did what it took to get the, the entire message across. Um, moving on, uh, we've got the critical tradition and um, the critical tradition um, as, um, you know, critical theory in any other um, field, it's talking about privilege versus power, uh, or sorry, privilege and power, um, and how it's afforded to some groups and not as much for others. And so in the critical tradition um, in uh, communication theory, we look at how language is gendered. So if you've ever uh, noticed in English, at least, we have Mr. to refer to men, but then we have Miss, Mrs. or Ms. to refer to women. And it's, um, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's interesting, um, but it's, um, it's strange how a man would have just one title um, to, you know, refer to him. Um, and it doesn't matter what, you know, like if he's young or old or, or whatnot, he would always be called Mr. Whereas Miss is typically used for, uh, for women who are, are young or unmarried. Mrs. is typically used for someone who's married. And then Ms. is used for somebody who's older, usually, um, and you don't know their marital status. And again, it's, um, it's one of those things where why is there, are there titles? Why are there titles that signify age and marital status for women? but none of that for men. And that's what the critical tradition looks at, you know, like what structures in our language provide more power or more privilege to some versus other. Um, for example, you know, if you see somebody who's called Miss Lee or, or Mrs. Lee, already there's things that you know about her that, it's none of your business really, right? Like whether she's married or not, that's none of our business. But with Mr., you would never know if he's married or not. Um, you would never know how old he is depending on this title. Whereas Miss usually, um, usually is used for younger women. Um, and so suddenly when you hear Miss, you're like, oh, okay, it's gonna be somebody who's like, you know, 30 and younger, right? So again, some of these uh, titles or things in language um, that are present gives you a lot more information about an individual than than it should. Um, and so Ardner, um, and Ardner, sorry, Shirley and Edwin Ardner, um, they had um, a um, the muted group theory, and 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 this theory talks about in how in anthropology sometimes um, a culture would be characterized in terms of the masculine. Um, and I, I hope that's changing nowadays um, where, you know, it's a more holistic view of, of a culture, um, both in terms of, you know, the masculine and feminine and the neuter as well, actually, um, you know, the in-between. Um, because often um, when we look at language, languages typically have served men better than women um, in many uh, societies and many cultures, not just in English. Um, and due to this inequality or this problem with the language, women appear to be less articulate or less powerful than men in public settings. And here I put an example um, about Japanese speech for, for males versus females, because again, um, I gave an example um, of you know, titles in English and how you know, suddenly um, you, there's less power afforded to some or, or there's um, information given out about people that shouldn't be given out just based on titles. But in Japanese, for example, there's specific forms of the language that only men can use. 
Um, for example, like there's a certain command style that um, if you say it um, and you're a female, people look at you like you're strange. Only a man can say it. And it makes him sound very powerful. It's, you know, you do not do this. And it's very sharp. It's very powerful. But only men can say it. A woman can't say it at all. Instead, a, a woman has to say, can you please not do this? And it's built into the language where it sounds a bit more demure. Um, it's, you know, can you please not do this versus do not do this? Um, if a woman does say, you know, it in a more harsh tone um, or in, um, in the style of the man, again, they're, they're looked at very strange because that's not how women speak. Um, and sometimes you, you hear that in, even in English, it's like, oh, you should be more ladylike in your speech. Um, but again, um, there's nothing that really differentiates, you know, um, word usage in English as much as it is codified in Japanese, for example, um, where they specifically have certain forms of speech that are only men. And it was taught to me this way. It's like um, the teacher went up and said, OK, all all the males, you should learn this thing because this is how the men speak. And women, you will learn this way, um, which is actually an OK way for anyone to speak, male or female. But only women could only use the 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 general one. They could never use this special one that only men could use. So, again, um, it's in this critical tradition, when you think about it, it's again, who is afforded power when speaking even? Um, and um, that's a, it's an interesting area to look at. Um, in one of my master's um, uh, studies that I did, uh, I, I looked at um, power dynamics um, in language in terms of what the government of Canada did. Um, when speaking about um, different groups of people. And that's on the next slide. Um, so this is uh, straight out from one of my, my papers. But essentially, the government of Canada, um, they have, for example, they have specific wording that they use um, in legal documents. So for example, in Canada, we'll often say Indigenous peoples. But the government of Canada would say Aboriginal people because it's a legal term for them to use. Um, and so when um, they put out, you know, um, different um, communications and such, the government of Canada, for example, um, by Statistics Canada, one of their agencies, they define racial minorities as persons other than Aboriginal peoples who are non-Caucasian in race or non-white in color. That's their exact definition and using their exact words. And how this is problematic is first of all, um, they, they, okay, so first of all, they ignore the fact that, um, you know, that there's many different um, groups, right? Uh, there's many different ethnocultural groups in Canada um, and that we can all be lumped into one, whether you're black, Latinx, Asian, whatever, you're all, you know, one group if you're, but you're just not Aboriginal and you're not white, right? And, and it's just kind of like, okay, that's strange. You know, I'm very different from my Black colleagues. I'm very different from my Latinx <laughs> colleagues, um, but we are all lumped together as one group um, because there's Caucasians are white, there are Aboriginal people or Indigenous people or you know, First Nations made to Inuit. And then all the others, as if we're one big group um, and we're all you know, interchangeable with each other, which we're not. Um, the second problematic aspect of this definition is that they make Caucasian people or white people the um, reference from which all other people are defined. It's like you're either white or you're not. And again, that's very problematic, um, especially as Canada is becoming more multicultural. Um, and so we want to ensure that, um, you know, that our language is more inclusive. And so um, I hope that at, at some point that, you know, the government of Canada um, and its agencies will try to strive for more inclusive language instead. 
um, and define um, ethnocultural groups um, in a more inclusive way than they do right now. And then finally, this is uh, my, my last uh, <laughs> bit, um, the last um, tradition of communication theory is a rhetorical tradition. Um, and this is uh, very uh, much rooted in the Greek uh, tradition. Um, so there's five canons of rhetoric. So uh, eventual or um, the creation of ideas, um, the invention of ideas, how you come up with, with the things that you're going to say. Dispositio, uh, which is arrangement, how you put things together um, to make a beginning, middle, or end, and how you arrange your arguments. Elocutio is a style. Um, you know, again, it depends on who your audience is. Do you deliver it um, in a way that, um, you know, is, uh, is very simple in language, but powerful in meaning? Or do you use very, like, um, you know, very um, eloquent words and such, uh, you know, what is the style that you're going for? Memoria, which is how do you memorize and how do you present things so that you can um, sound authoritative um, and an expert in your area. And then finally, actio, which is delivery. Um, and again, it's very close to elocutio, but again, how do you deliver this um, in such a way that is very powerful? Um, and then um, I went to Wikipedia actually to go grab this, <laughs> this last quote um, because it, it, it works so well. It's rhetoric is an application of language in order to instruct and to persuade the listener and the reader. Um, it, it is truly about um, conveying information in such a way that people are convinced that you know this is this is right or this is true and this is something that I, I should you know learn or I should commit to. Um, it's a combination of grammar or knowledge that's now understood the logic aspect and being transmitted outwards as wisdom and that's rhetoric itself. Um, and. That's it. Um, these are the different uh, resources that you can look at if uh, you're interested in more about uh, linguistic anthropology versus um, communication theories. But otherwise, I want to thank you so much for your participation today and for listening, um, especially for an early morning class um, over Zoom. Um, and thank you, Kevin, for including me today. I um, hope that this was helpful and informative for, for, for you all. Thank you.